Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm not really good with slides, but you might think that innovation in my company where we make games would apply to the games, that there's a lot of innovation in product development, and that's true. But in addition to that, in a company, I can tell you from growing it from day one without one single piece of paper to start with to year 32 requires a lot of innovation in every single part of the company. Even in accounting, so accounting, you really don't want to be, do creative accounting because that would not be a good thing, but you can innovate on the tools that you use to do that accounting. And so you can do a lot of things with efficiencies. So what do I do every day to face how I navigate the challenges? First of all, I don't do it alone, but leadership is really required. I've learned that. Um, I can say now that I'm an experienced, kind, passionate, and confident leader, and it feels really good, but it took a long time to get there. So here we go. Take a look at this app. You can buy this on your phone for $2. You can buy lots of apps for $2. You can get apps for free. So that's really tough competition for a company that makes games itself for an average of $20 in the store. Um, this, the app market I know has been around for a while, but I'm going back in time a little bit. But more on this in a minute. I think you'll get a kick out of this. Um, this is Bill and I in 1984. We met each other when we were 28. We started dating, we moved in together, we bought a house, and we started our business within one year of when we met. Now, some people call that innovative. We personally call it a little crazy. Um, we are still married, believe it or not, um, and we have raised two amazing sons and um, really grown a business. There are a lot of similarities in both of those things. It takes a lot of nurturing. So a lot of people say that when, you, when an entrepreneur starts a company, they can only take it so far. And we believed that, so um, we were encouraged to bring in the professionals. Now, by this time, in the mid-90s, we'd already been in the Inc. 500 four years in a row. It was a big accomplishment. It wasn't something we chased, but it's something that happened. So we are never been cocky, but we thought, well, we kind of think we know what we're doing. But anyway, we fell for it, and we went out, and we got the professionals. So why didn't we put our trust in ourselves and our team? Um, it's only sometimes when you look back that you understand these things. We thought there must be people out there that knew more than we did. So we brought the professionals in, and it didn't work. Um, they were very nice people, but really what happened is, and sometimes consultants do this, they came in with their knowledge of what they had done, where they had been. But when they came to our company, they didn't take the time, and maybe it was our fault too, to understand what Think Fun was really about. What were we trying to do? We weren't trying to just raise revenues. We were trying to get our products, which are the byproduct of scientists, mathematicians, and teachers, and even our son Sam, who created a game and got a patent when he was 12, we're trying to bring those to the world. And the revenues will follow if you do that, at least in our minds. Well, anyway, it didn't work. We faced a big choice. We said, OK, bring in more professionals, go back to doing things the way we did before, but we decided to pick door number three. I decided to put our trust entirely in our team. <laughs> so this is only some of them. They like to dress up as game pieces for Halloween. Um, our office gets transformed for every holiday. Halloween was particularly scary. Um, in our office, things, spiders jumping out at you, and you know, all the while, we're still getting business done because the fall is a very busy time in a toy company, in a game company. So I'm going to talk about disruption. <laughs> now, I love Amazon. In fact, um, I was talking to someone backstage about the fact that on our website, we, instead of doing our own e-commerce, we actually have buttons that take you straight to Amazon because that's easier for people. It's what I want, so we just, that's what we do. We do a huge business with Amazon. They're an incredible partner. But what happened in the early days is we found uh, a company like us selling to neighborhood toy stores. We really value that business. Um, when the stuff went online, it started getting discounted. And then there were resellers. And then people were buying from us who didn't really have a store. 
We didn't know that. And they were just reselling on Amazon. And then the prices were getting driven down. Now, you might say as a consumer, yay, that's great. But actually, along the way in business, everybody needs to make a little bit of money or you don't get to keep innovating. And that's just a fact. So I'm a problem solver. I absolutely love solving problems. I will take apart my dryer if a sock gets stuck in it. Um, so here's what we came up with. And this was very bold, and we did run it by our attorney to make sure we were allowed to do this. But we created this policy, and we stuck to it, and we turned away a lot of business. We're not a gigantic company. We're a medium-sized company. To turn away $100,000 of business is a big deal, especially if you are a salesperson and your compensation is based partially on the revenues. So we had to change that, too, because we didn't want to demotivate anybody. This was a great decision for us. It was very bold. Um, we lost some business, but we feel like we got quality over quantity. And we were protecting our brand, which we really care about. So back to the challenge of competing in the app market. You can get an app for free, or you can buy a game for $30. Um, they don't offer the same things. And so when we started thinking about this and thinking about innovation, we thought, OK, what do we do? We need to create some games that have characteristics that you can't duplicate in an app. And that was a way that we felt we could make some progress. So what we do when we create games, as I mentioned, we work with teachers, mathematicians, scientists. Um, you can go to our website and ring the, read the long story. But that's the joy that we get, is we, we take these complicated things and we make them fun and accessible. We call it think funizing. It's kind of hard to say, but we kind of joke about that in the company. So one of the first ones, people might recognize Rush Hour. It's, a, it's our crown jewel. <laughs> um, a gentleman named Nob Yoshikahara brought this to us from Japan. Now remember, we started in our basement. So when I say things like that, it's not that big a deal. It's, you know, things happen over time. But Rush Hour started out as a sliding block puzzle. Um, like the 15 puzzle, sort of, if you've ever, something like that. Our innovation was to create challenges that went from beginning to intermediate to advanced and to make it more three-dimensional. And it's been a hit for over 20 years, maybe 25. Honestly, I, I can't even remember. But the thing about Rush Hour is it's even more fun as an app because you can do things like what minimum moves. You can watch it solve itself. You can do things like that. And actually, uh, my older son, Sam, convinced us to pay him to learn how to program by programming Rush Hour for the App Store. And he's now a pretty world-level coder guy. So what are we going to do? We've got to do something where the physical product can't be duplicated. Well, there were a couple of different directions. We thought about jumping into the app market, but it wasn't really in our DNA. We didn't have the technical skills and the know-how and not that we didn't want to maybe do something new, but we decided not to do that. We did shift a little bit to younger ages where people are more concerned about screen time. But then we decided to stick to what we had really innovated as a concept of this multi-level challenge. And what did we do? Well, we decided to come up with Laser Maze. And Laser Maze is $30, not $20. So we went up in price. But here's what this did. And there are some of these on the activity break you can play. You cannot duplicate the fun of using a real laser to hit beam splitters and mirrors to try to get to a target. And there are 40 challenges, and you can't do that in an app. Um, we have it online to play on our website just to try it out, but we, that's what we did. Because of that, Laser Maze was followed by Gravity Maze, our business has actually doubled in the last two years in the face of a lot of competition where people in the app world certainly are knocking rush hour off all the time. And in the physical games, um, we get knocked off all over the world now. I mean, we're a global company. We're in 50 countries. And it's very frustrating um, to see your product get copied, especially with inferior materials. <laughs> so that's what we did. Um, because of this kind of innovation, we make things harder on ourselves because as I was getting ready for this talk, um, and I have to thank Susan for inviting me, I realized that, you know, I think, I think we're getting a little stale again. Um, just internally, you have to try to stay ahead of things, and not just for the sake of it, but because the world changes. 
So I do thank Susan for pushing me because I've been thinking about nothing about innovation for the last couple weeks. And when I go back, my team is going to be very surprised at all the new ideas I've thought about <laughs> <laughs> to push them in marketing and product and everything else. But they'll be happy. But innovation for us is not just about business things and the company. It's really about a personal passion for me. Um, so I get to you know, have this great company. Um, I think it's a miracle every day that we survive the last 32 years. I can't quite believe it sometimes. But all of that is fun, but then I also get to really work on the DNA of our company. And culture is incredibly important to us. Um, imagine you all have families in one way or another, and um, so does everybody at our office. So how we innovated in the early days is we took tiny steps every day making decisions that were just trying to keep us going, like just to stay in business. You know, no income for three years is a, is a really tough thing. We would team with competitors and share customer lists. Nobody does that these days. Uh, but that was the 80s, and the 80s were different. Um, always quality over quantity. Always. No compromise. Um, with our games, you either get it in a box that you want to keep, or you get a bag to throw the game into. Because I'm a mom, and, that, and parents want that, and it makes it easier. So if our margins go down, that's okay. We're going to deliver on that promise. And we want you to get more than you thought you paid for when you get it home, which is kind of opposite of some things that you buy. So that's, we're very proud of that. Um, but innovation can come in really small steps, but in my mind, they add up to big strides. And sometimes it's not until you look back where you say, oh, that makes sense. I must have known what I was doing. So you kind of have to trust yourself that maybe you do, but you might not know it till later. So just that's one of my things. So um, oh, a little over, about 20 years ago, I lost one of my sisters to a very rare cancer. Um, we were very close. And when it happened, it was, it was kind of fast, and it was sudden, and it was very sad. Now, the company always, it was like, you know, we felt we had to be there every day, or it was just not going to work, not because our people weren't good, but because we kind of run it lean and things like that, but I dropped everything so many times to fly out and be with her and to be with her family. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the company survived. Everybody stepped up. We had a great culture. Everybody knew that they needed to do, fill in the, you know, the blanks. And luckily, cell phones also had come along by that time. Um, so babies. We have so many babies being born. <laughs> Not at the company, but by the women who... <laughs> and, you know, some places I've worked before we started this, where if somebody said they were having a baby, people are like, oh, you know, I think somebody recently said it's an inconvenience for a company. Well, guess what? It's not. And we don't call it maternity leave. We call it baby leave. Because in the employment manuals you get, maternity leave is a disability. And I don't really think it is. So now we have a new dad. Just in the last week, our art director, Chris, um, they had a baby. And it was the first time, and it might be the second, but I think it's the first time that a, a dad was there. So we're like, oh, we have to create a policy. And I get to do that. I get to say yes. I get to say yes, you have baby leave. You don't have as much as your wife, or you know, as a woman, because you didn't actually deliver the baby. But you should stay home and be with that baby whenever you want to. So I, I'm really proud of that. A um, couple other examples. Um, people move. We keep them if they're good. And so I've had at least three or four occasions when someone has come to me and said, um, well, here's my last slide. It's not important, but we'll leave it up there. Um, oh, my, my father's going to give us a house so we can move back to where I grew up and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, we don't want to lose you. And so we have that conversation and we figure it out. And we weren't set up originally as a company that had um, you know, distance workers, but now we have four. And it works fine. It just works fine. So you adapt. And so the point is that I'm lucky. I get to create these things. I don't have to be doing anything for anybody at my company that I wouldn't want someone to do for me. And it's, it's really a joy. Uh, we're never on autopilot. As I mentioned, I've got a ton of ideas about things when I go back, so that'll be interesting. So I'm gonna, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this with you, but I am because it's current. So now we're 32 years in, company's in great shape, 
I actually can go exercise for an hour, three days a week. <laughs> and, you know, every, everybody's doing really well. But in the last um, six months, I was diagnosed with um, something called smoldering myeloma. And it's a precursor to multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. Now, I'm really lucky. I don't have any symptoms. It was a complete fluke that I learned this. So I do feel lucky. So one day in my executive meeting, I was thinking, you know, I'm the one who talks about transparency all the time. I'm the leader of this company. I mean, Bill is there, but he's a creative wacko, and he doesn't want to do <laughs> all the stuff that I do. <laughs> I mean, he would go insane. <laughs> um, so thank him for the products and thank our product team. Anyway, so I decided to share this very spontaneously, and it was interesting because Bill kind of got a tear in his eye, and I'm like, that's not why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you because most of the people on that team were there when we brought the experts in. So if something were to ha be happen and I was have to, would have to leave for a year or do something and focus on my health, which is what I would encourage anybody to do, what do you guys want to do? You want to bring in an expert? Or should we figure out a model that can work for us? Should we figure out something where maybe one of you will rise to be the COO temporarily or permanently, but maybe you won't want to. So now the challenge to them and the thing we're going to figure out in the next month, and not because they're urgency, I'm totally fine, it's just because we should figure it out. I mean, frankly, what if something happened and I was hit by a bus? I, I really believe in having things organized so people can step in and take care of it because the company is bigger than me. It's bigger than Bill now. And um, it took a long time to get there. So the last thing I want to say is that I think um, we're all innovators. I think the way I thought about it as I prepared for this was every decision you make almost, and each of you sitting next to each other, you have no idea how innovative the next person is because it might not be in the same way you are. And there are speakers here, you know, we have a Nobel Prize speaker. I was sitting next to her and I'm like, wow, I'm like a game company and I get, <laughs> but we just all do different things. So that's what I have to say to you today. I really appreciate being able to be here. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.